Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at together. Open your Bibles with me if you have a copy of the Word of God. Philippians chapter 4, and look at verse 19. One of the most precious promises in the Word of God. Uh, we, we've started this uh, series in the book of Philippians way back at the beginning of the month of February. And uh, I, I believe Brother Burkett, who was with us, preached from Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and then I, he didn't realize I was just starting a new series of Philippians. And, and so we started this series in flat chapter 4, and now we're finishing in chapter 4. Uh, I, may, I may preach one more message next week, uh, just to, to tie it all together from this, past, from this uh, book. But uh, I've really enjoyed this, this series, Phrases from Philippians. It's so packed with things. But look at this precious promise in verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's read it once more together. And hopefully you can even memorize this verse and make it a, a real part of your life. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank You so much for being our God. Father, we pray that You'll help us today. Father, we ask for a special blessing as we study Your Word together. And we ask for, uh, for a special blessing for each person that's here. Father, I pray that it can truly be said that You are our God and that we realize just how wonderful uh, of a fact that is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Philippians chapter 4 uh, is all about missions. We, we, we were talking about faith promise missions a moment ago, and we're going to be turning in these uh, faith promise cards today. And God's timing is perfect, isn't it? Uh, I, I wasn't uh, planning to preach a message about missions on the same exact day as what that was happening, but that's where we are here in the book of Philippians. And missions is something that should not just be in our head. It's something that should be in our hearts. It's, a, it's the heartbeat of God. You know, we, why, why do we support missionaries? Why does this church in Philippi support Paul? Well, we have something that other people need. We really believe that, don't we? We have something that everyone in this world needs to have, and that is the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we should want to be a church just like the Philippian church, who was active, playing an active role in this in what God is doing, in reaching others with the gospel message. You know? And so here as God uh, places it upon the hearts of these Philippians to give out of their poverty to support the Apostle Paul, he was in prison, but he, he was under house arrest actually in Rome. Uh, in, he was in prison on the, in, at this time in that sense. And so he had, to, he had to pay the rent even for his own house where he was under house arrest. And so he had that expense. He was confident that he was going to uh, be able to get out. He was trying to train people while he was there. The last chapter of the book of Acts tells us about that situation where he was under house arrest. But lots of people, it was free for lots of people to come to him. And he would preach the gospel from the window. And all these people would be listening. And he would preach and he would train. And, and, uh, and he wanted to get out and do more missionary journeys. And so this church said, let's keep supporting the Apostle Paul. No matter what, let's keep it, keep it going. And so even in their poverty, they said, it says here they said once and again. And so Paul says, as they do this, he wants them to know God will <laughs> supply their needs as well. God's going to supply their needs. So um, it, it, the church who's evangelizing, God's going to supply for them. As long as they're doing it God's way, God's going to meet their needs. You know, the, God's work done God's work done God's way uh, for God's glory will always never lack God's supply. And so God says, he, he promises, God shall supply all your need. There are some prerequisites here uh, that we're going to look at at the end but uh, of giving. But, uh, uh, but he says that's, that's what the promise is, God will provide. This is a church, God will provide for this church because this is a church that evangelizes. A church that does not evangelize will eventually fossilize or apostatize. And so we want to be a church that evangelizes. We don't want to apostatize and, and uh, go into every other thing imaginable that churches do nowadays besides the main thing. Uh, we don't want to be a church that fossilizes, that just turns inward and says, let's hold the fort. Uh, 
you know, until Jesus comes and, and see, say, you know, um, my four and no more and, and, you know, that type of mindset. But we should be reaching out to others. This is a church that cared for others. Look at verse 10. It says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. They were mindful of wanting to care for him, but sometimes they weren't able to because of, because of his situation. But he says, you cared for me. So this is a church that cared for others. They cared for the servant of God as he was trying to reach sinners for God. These are the missionaries that God has called to their respective fields. Do we care for them? They cared for the servant of God. They cared for the sinners that needed the Savior as well. Uh, they... they um, they cared about the people that Paul was reaching. That's, that's why he was doing it. They, they thought that not only was the Apostle Paul worth supporting, they thought that the souls were worth it all as well. So they gave sacrificially to that. But most of all, they thought that God was worth it. And, uh, and it says that this was well-pleasing to God, what they did. And so as they did those things, Paul's saying to them, God will provide. We have a God who provides. My God shall supply all your needs, all your need. And, uh, you know, we can say that here at this church, can't we? From day one here at this church, God has provided, hasn't He? God's provided. He provided a community center for the Hughes when they started the church, didn't He? He provided this beautiful building that we meet in. God's provided uh, the, the leadership that our church needs through the years. God's provided pianists. Uh, that, that we need. God has provided workers who choir. God's provided website workers, who, people who post things on the internet. And, uh, but, but also God's provided finances, hasn't he? And we could say, our church has proved this verse, haven't we? God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory. You know, we, we're a church that doesn't owe any, anything. We have money in the bank. We have, uh, uh, God provides week by week by week. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen the fulfilling of this. And there's no explanation for how this church could be here other than God's done it. Isn't that right? Uh, God's done it. And so God provides. And so the apostles reminding them that he's always met their needs and he always will. They've been generous. God will bless them and give them. But it's, it's, uh, it's not automatic that God provides. They have to meet certain prerequ prerequisites. They've already given uh, themselves... It says in 2 Corinthians, the churches in Philippi, in Macedonia, they had given of themselves first, and then they'd given out of their deep poverty, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And, and, uh, and so they had given themselves. So we see that there are certain prerequisites sometimes. And uh, he says here, but my God shall supply all your needs. You know, first of all, he says, my God. First of all, he has to be your God. Is he your God? He says, "My God." It's it's a personal thing. You know, there's a there's a, a, a wonderful correlation with Psalm 23. It says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." He has to be your shepherd first of all, and it's a personal thing. My God shall supply all your needs. So the first thing we see here is the source, the source of our need, the inexhaustible source. And if you are not plugged into that source, you cannot quote this verse and claim this promise for yourself. But my God shall supply. We see there the personal uh, nature of this. Is he your God? Are you a Christian? There was a, a boy once who went off to Bible college and uh, he, uh, he came back to his home church and he had learned so, uh, Psalm 23 while he was there. And he quoted the whole of Psalm 23. He got up in front of the church and the pastor got him up. This, I actually heard this story from uh, uh, a pastor in Ohio. And uh, he, it, was a, it was a black church, an old black church. So this boy came back to the front and, and uh, he quoted Psalm 23. And so they all clapped and cheered. Yeah, that's great. And so then a little lady at the back said, Pastor, I want to quote Psalm 23. I can quote it. So she came to the front, and she quoted Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And uh, they knew what that lady had been through in her life. And so at the end of uh, when she was saying it, there was not a dry eye in the house. Everybody was crying. And so uh, what was the difference between when 
the, the, the boy said it and when the old lady said it, it's because they knew that from experience she was saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, God had provided for her all along the way. And so, what about you? Do you, ha do you have that experience? Can you say, He is my shepherd? He is my God. My God will supply all your needs. Look at who this is. Right here at the beginning of Philippians 4.19, at the, the very head of the verse, He's the one who's pledging uh, to supply your needs. That's a very front-loaded verse. God, my God. God is limitless in His resources. His supply is vast. He's, you know, he has, he's the ultimate supplier of all of our needs. Really. You know, we, other people might meet your needs. Other people might give. God might use them to give towards certain needs that we have. But ultimately, God's the one who provided them with those means. God's the one who gave them the ability to, to work. God's the one who gave them the strength to work. There's a story about a, an atheist who said that uh, his, his little boy had been over at, at his friend's house where they had prayed for their dinner. And he said, Dad, why don't we pray uh, for our dinner? And he said, I, I don't have to pray for my dinner. And he said, I work hard for this food. It's, I'm the one who should, you should thank. You don't have to thank God. And uh, they lived on a farm. And so, the, uh, so he said, let's just pray. And the little boy said, I mean, let's just eat. The little boy said, hey, that's just what the pigs do. They don't thank God. They just eat. You know? <laughs> but that's true, isn't it? You know, uh, they, they just, uh, there's, there's no concept, no, no capability of thought about uh, what God does for us and what He provides for us. But uh, God works to supply those means. He sends the sunshine and the rain upon the evil and the good. And we should realize that He's the one who's placed these things in our hands. He's the one who perhaps has op opens people's hearts to meet others' needs. He's the supplier, the perfect supplier. You know, God even has a name in the book of Genesis, uh, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord provides. And we have a God who is the source of all of our needs. In Matthew chapter 7, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about how earthly fathers give to their children, but he's saying how much more the Heavenly Father will give to His children. And uh, write down this reference, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you, Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For he, every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you, whom if his son ask bread, will, give him, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him. And so this is, uh, he say, as an extension of Himself. He is our Heavenly Father. Even more so than an earthly father, He wants to provide. This is our source, this is our hope for our church. But not only do we see the source, we see the surety of this promise. Look at the verse again in Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need. <laughs> if if it's this God supplying, then you will be supplied. Uh, the Lord, if the Lord is your shepherd, then then uh, you're going to be looked after. You know, this is not. He says, "My God shall supply." This is something sure. This is something. Uh, this is a, a th something you can you can bank on. He's not saying this is just going to happen uh, sometimes. This is just going to happen a percentage of the time. He'll always supply your need. My God shall supply all your need, he says. Uh, the Bible speaks about who, who God is and the fact that we can count on Him. And it's not just something future. He says, My God shall supply your need according to His riches in glory. So it's not something that you have just future in glory, but it's according to the riches in glory. So it's not something you only have when you get to heaven, and we're so thankful that God's provided heaven, aren't we? God's, God has provided all that we need for heaven. You know, He's provided salvation for you. Salvation is a sure thing, isn't it? Christians are sure people. Christians are certain people. We are certain of heaven. We know that we're saved. And so if we can know that we're saved, we can know that God will provide. If God's willing to give us His own Son, how much more shall He also freely give us all things, the Bible says. You know, that's what He's done for us. He's provided His Son. 
You know, there He provided for your salvation. It's a sure thing. He provided. You, you cannot provide for your own salvation. You can't do it. Uh, people try to work their way to heaven. They try to do good works to go to heaven. But uh, as I said recently when I was speaking in the city center, I said if you, there's two types of religions in the world. There's do, 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 and then there's done. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. He said uh, telelestai, which is... Uh, that means that's, it is finished. And that, the, that word was a, a, an accounting term. And if somebody's bill was paid in full, they would write telelestai on the bill. It is finished. And that's what Jesus said, telelestai. And uh, he, it is paid in full. He's provided it all. And your, etern your eternal punishment in hell was condensed into six awful hours on the cross as Jesus bled and died for your sins. He provided His own Son. For God so loved you, God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but everlasting life. What wonderful provision. And that's something that's sure and certain. And we can also be sure and certain about this as well. Let me, let me read you a few more verses from the Psalms that talk about our great God. And you can mark down these verses as well, if you're taking notes. Psalm 34, verse 9. O oh, fear the Lord, ye His saints, for there is no want to them that fear Him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Psalm 34, verse 9. Psalm 37, verse 25. Psalm 37, verse 25. I have been young and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. That's King David speaking. Psalm 37, verse 25. Psalm 84, verse 11. Psalm 84, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And we've already read from the Sermon on the Mount, which says that he's a heavenly father and and right before, also elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, right before the, uh, the model prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Jesus said these words. He says, Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. You know, he knows. He knows us. He's our Father. And there's no head, what he's trying to say there is, what Paul's trying to say here to the church of Philippi, there's not any hesitancy on the part of God he, he wants to give, He wants to supply in His good timing according to His perfect will. So we see the, the source, we see, the, uh, uh, we see the, the surety of this promise, but we also see the sufficiency of this promise. Look at the verb in Philippians 4.19. It says, But my God shall supply. Supply. That means to fill to the full. You know, we, we, we mentioned Psalm 23 earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But later on in the verse it says, my cup runneth over. He fills to the full. He supplies. There's no, nothing that is lacking for a Christian. You know, you might say, well, I, I, I do have some lack. Well, there's a different, God knows exactly what you need. And uh, if, if you're living your life according to His will, then uh, if you're meeting these prerequisites, you know, the Bible doesn't teach uh, laziness. That's not what this is about. The Bible says that he that shall not work shall not eat, for example. And so there are certain qualifications, prerequisites. You, you have to do your part, and then God will do his part. Um, you have to make sure that he's your God. You have to make sure that you're doing your part. You have to make sure that you're not doing it for your own. Uh, you're not doing it for, so you can ask it upon your own. Asking... So you can fulfill it on your own lust, the book of James says. But if you're, if you're meeting those prerequisites, this is a promise for you. You, know, you might say, well, I need health. Well, Charles Spurgeon said the greatest blessing in life is good health. But then he said the second greatest blessing in life is bad health. Because it helps you to uh, lean more upon the Lord and learn some great lessons from God. God gives us to the full everything that we need. He supplies. We can rest in His hand. He cares for us, as we've just heard some from the ladies. And uh, what does He supply? It says He'll supply to the full, but what does He supply? He says, My God shall supply all your need. All your need. And so, not just a sampling of your need, not just a few of your needs, 
all your need. So that's a promise from God. And uh, it, it apply, it's, it's talking about this church, the need of this church collectively. They're giving to missions. God will supply your church's need. But I believe we can apply it to individuals as well. You know, God's, God is very clear that uh, what God's, what God's supposed, to, what, what's supposed to happen in the earth is supposed to happen to the local church. But the church is made up of individuals. And so this does apply to individuals even as well who are in the church. And so he says, uh, my God shall supply all your need. Uh, look, look at the preposition after that, according to. According to his riches in glory. And so here we see, in keeping with his riches in glory. You know, uh, God will supply all your need, not all your greed. Uh, all your need, but how will he do it? He'll do that over and above what you need even. Over and above. He'll supply your need um, in a generous way, according to his riches in glory. If Bill Gates were to come into Calvary Baptist Church today, uh, you know, Bill Gates, the richest, I guess he's still the richest man in the world, except for maybe that guy in Mexico. Uh, I think he just passed him up. But uh, anyway, if he were to come in and gave a five-pound note in the offering plate. That would be a generous gesture, I suppose. But that would not be according to his riches in his bank account, would it? That would not be in proportion to his riches. And uh, that's what God's that's what God say here. God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so above and beyond. An inexhaustible supply. According to that. So it's absolutely nothing for God to supply our needs. Um, and, and according to what? What's the object there? According to his riches. What are God's riches? You know, when Jesus Christ was upon the earth, he didn't have much physical riches at his disposal. Um, he didn't even have a place where to lay his head. But yet, uh, he was able, he had a God, didn't he? he? He was God, and he had all the power of God behind him. And so he, when he needed to pay his taxes... What did he do? He just went and fishing, and, and he told Peter to go fishing, and he said, you'll find two coins to pay the taxes in the fish's mouth. I'm doing this according to the riches of God. And when he didn't have food to feed the 5,000, what happened? The great miracle of the loaves and the fishes. So he was living according to the riches in glory. And now, he's the one who is the supplier, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Uh, we'll look at that in just a moment, but but uh, what are God's riches? Psalm 50, verse 10. Psalm 50, verse 10 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. That's what uh, God says. And in that passage in Psalm 50, the people of Israel are saying, Well, um, should we, 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 we're not really giving, you know, but God said, I don't need your offerings. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I own it all. I don't need your offerings, but you should give, you should give to the Lord uh, your offerings just out of a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving and out of worship. It's not that God needs your money in the offering plate. He doesn't need anything, but y y you need it. And uh, you need to be able to give. It helps you and your faith. And, um, and then in Psalm 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The whole earth, everything in it. You know, there's a story about uh, Bob Jones University was having a bit of uh, difficulty with some finances. And at that time, uh, Henry Ironside was on the committee. Uh, on, he was one of the trustees. and So they were trying to figure out what they were going to do, how they were going to pay for something in particular. And Henry Ironside said, well, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We should just ask him to... to Kill one of those cattle and sell it, sell it, and give us the money. And uh, God can provide. And while they were in the meeting, the secretary came to the door, and uh, they said, "They said, well, can you come back later?" She said, "Well, there's a man here. I think you should you should speak to him." And uh, so the, the uh, Bob Jones went out there, and it was a it was a rich Texas rancher, and he said, "I had I had a whole lot more cattle than I needed. I was I was going to sell some and see if you needed any of the money from that." And so Henry Ironside was quoting the Bible, and it happened exactly as he said. He was a, being a prophet, I suppose, in a sense. So uh, God owns it all. He doesn't spoil us. He doesn't pamper us. He doesn't uh, indulge us. 
but this verse does say that he he will give us all that we need. If he if he spoiled us, then we would get we probably wouldn't be able to handle prosperity very well. We would get lazy. We would get uh, self sufficient. We get lax in what we do. We'd stop praying. We would stop depending upon the Lord. Stop looking to Him. But uh, so He doesn't pamper us or spoil us. But He does give us all that we need. All that we need. God's provision. And so, uh, what does He provide? Your need. And in this context, it was financial need. The financial that they had given to the, the Apostle Paul, and he says God's going to provide for your financial need, but we can apply it to all of our need. You know, we, we have different needs that come up. Need for workers, need for uh, people, need for, uh, for different talents and things like that. God will provide all that we need. Uh, you, you know that phrase that I said earlier, God's work done God's way for God's glory will never lack God's supply. So if we do lack God's supply, we'd have to re-examine to see if we are doing things God's way mm -hmm. and for God's glory. But uh, you know, remember this was not an un this was not an unusually rich church. In two Corinthians chapter eight, it says that, as I said earlier, it says that the churches from Macedonia gave out of their deep poverty, and yet God gave back to them out of His rich liberality. And uh, and so here we see not only the the sufficiency we we looked at the sufficiency of this promise, looked at the source of this promise, we've looked at the sh the surety of this promise. But what's the sphere of this promise? It says, well, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So where, where is the physic, where's the location of, this, of the source of this riches? What's the address? It's in glory. According to His riches, in glory. You know? The glory, glory is a word sometimes used for heaven. It's a use, word we use for heaven. And uh, the glory land. You know, we have songs about it. But there's no recession in heaven that's going to affect God's supply. Never. There's no moths that are going to eat up God's supply. There's no rust that's going to corrupt it. There's no thieves that can break in and steal it. Uh, you know, here on the earth, we, we have all those things. But in the treasury vaults of heaven, God's riches are untouched by the affairs of any of the affairs of this world. And it's according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus, it says. So in glory by Christ Jesus... Jesus Christ, as we said earlier, had, didn't have much physical things on the earth, but he had an inexhaustible, inexhaustible supply behind him. And he's now the distributor of all these things. He's the mediator. He's able to distribute. He's the head of the church according to any of the needs that are in any of his churches, according to his good pleasure and according to his perfect will, according to his perfect knowledge. And uh, he is the one. And he's able to keep his church going under any circumstances whatsoever. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church has kept going through everything. Through Nero trying to destroy it, through people getting killed, the Bible cannot be destroyed, the church cannot be destroyed, God's able to keep it going through any circumstance. And uh, he's able to provide for this, for this church in Philippi, he's able to supply for this church in Peterborough, and, but as I said, it's not laziness, but uh, we've looked at all of these words in this verse, but we didn't really look at the very first word in it, that conjunction at the beginning of it. But, my God, shall supply all your need. When I was a kid, we saw, I uh, used to watch this TV show, a cartoon called, uh, it was all about the different parts of speech, and there was a little song, conjunction, junction, what's your function, and, and uh, you know, whenever there's a conjunction, you figure out what it's there for, and... Uh, this little word, uh, but it's a conjunction. You always see what the what the what it's a it's a train pulling something. A conjunction is a train, and what's it pulling? It's pulling the verses that precede it. And so every verse you ha you have to read in the Bible, you have to look at it in its context. And so that little word, but, connects verse 19 to all the previous verses, uh, at least back to verse 14. And uh, that's why it says in verse 14 that they have sacrificially given to God's work and that they've done well by doing this sacrificial they've communicated with his affliction they've, they've partnered with him in his affliction in prison when he was in prison they partnered with him in prayer they partnered with him in giving and so he says now in verse 15 you, you Philippians know that when, that no other church when it says when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only 
You know, he left, it says in verse 16, he left and went to Thessalonica. Even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. I like that. I've underlined those words, once and again. That's what we do. We send once and again regular support to our missionaries. And so uh, he, in Thessalonica, he went to Thessalonica to do some more work. It, the church, there's no record of the church in Thessalonica. They never gave anything to Paul. But the church in Philippi kept giving to Paul. And uh, you know the Pavits are up there in, Hart, in Durham and Hartlepool. They're not, there's nobody giving to them up there. But we're continuing to give to them as even after they, that's, there's a practical example. But uh, he says, uh, you, you, you were poor, it says in 2 Corinthians, but you, you gave. But then he sees very quick to say, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. It's not, he says, I'm not a, a money grabber. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not after your money. I'm not after the gift. I'm not a huckster or whatever. I'm not one of these TV preachers. Who, uh, who, who gets money and uses it for their own pro personal profit. You know, that's what a lot of people do. They, they have uh, multiple houses. You know, but Paul, he didn't ha God didn't, he didn't have any house. You know, I'm talking about these preachers who have jets and they have uh, all those sorts of things. But Paul didn't have any house. I'm not preaching against having multiple houses. I'm saying uh, these pre preachers who, uh, who use God's money for that. And so... Uh, uh, you know, but Paul didn't have any house. Why didn't God provide him a house? Because God knew he didn't have need of a house. It wasn't a need, a personal need for him. He, he, God knew that he was going to be a martyr, which is the greatest privilege anybody could have, uh, giving their life for Christ. He was going to be beheaded. And so he didn't need a house. So that's not something God provided for him. And uh, But so many people, they, they are in it just for the money. They're called hirelings in the Bible. And, uh, but he, Paul says, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm not desiring the gift. What I desire is the fruit that comes out of that gift that you're giving. I'm desiring fruit that can abound to your account. The spiritual fruit that can come out of it. And uh, in other words, he's saying there's an account. There's an account in heaven that you're going to get rewarded for because you've given to me. What he's saying is God sees. God knows. God remembers. God rewards. God blesses for what you give. And, uh, of course, your account, what's this account? Does, a, does each church have an account in heaven that gets rewarded? Well, a church is made up of individuals, isn't it? When, we, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be rewarded, the Bible says, each man according to his own labor in the book of 2 Corinthians. Each man, each man will, will stand individually before God. You know, God's work is supposed to be done through a local church, but when you get to heaven, you're not going to get to stand there at the judgment seat of Christ with me or with any other pastor or with any other person in your family. You'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ personally. So as we give towards missions, you might say, well, I believe the church has it covered. But are you going to be rewarded for what the church does? Well, you. what about you personally? Don't you want to get in on what God's doing? And so he says, your account. It's fruit for your account. Every time a soul gets saved, since you've given personally to missions, that's going to be put onto your account uh, through any of our missionaries. And so, missions is a blessing. It's a blessing uh, to you in the next life. Verse 17, fruit that may abound to your account. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. Let me just turn there for a moment. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. says, For ye had compassion on me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So he says there's, it's uh, something that is a blessing in the life to come. Also in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So in the life to come. Secondly, it's a blessing now to the missionary in this life. Verse 18 says, but I have all and abound, I am full. I'm sorry, back to Philippians chapter 4. I have all and abound, I am full, having received of, 
Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So it was a blessing to Paul. I'm full. I abound. I've, I've received of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the, the pastor of the church we believe in Philippi, and we spoke about him a few weeks ago and about how faithful he was in chapter 2. But uh, he received that gift, and so now he's full and he's about... Look at that word, full. He says, you, I'm full. You have completely, fully supplied my need. And so now, verses 18 and 19 are mirror image of each other. You've supplied my need. God will supply your need to the full. You've supplied me to the full, I've, I've, and I'm even abounding. I have more than I need. God says that God's going to supply your need, and you'll have more than you need. And uh, we, we can see that carried out in our life as well. And then, not only is it a blessing to you in the, in the future, it's a blessing to the missionary now in this life, but it's, a ble it's an eternal blessing to God Himself. He says, What you gave was an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And so it's a blessing to you in the future, it's a blessing to the missionary now, it's a blessing to God eternally, and it's a blessing to you even in this life. God will supply all your need in this life as well. And so may the Lord help us to realize that God has supplied everything for salvation. May we come to Him for that supply. Take, there, there's no reason why any single person should have to go to hell. No one has to go to hell. Jesus Christ has supplied. So come to Him today. If you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, come say, I know I'm poor and needy. I know I cannot save myself. My good works can't save me. I'm a sinner. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And He rose again. And He has the, all, all that I need. He's offering it to me. So, but you have to personally pray and ask Christ to save you. And so if you haven't done that, please do that today. And, uh, and trust Christ as your Savior. Just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. But by faith, I ask you to save me. And come and speak to me afterwards about that. But, but if God will do that for you, don't you think, as, his, as your Heavenly Father, He'll supply all your other needs as well. Let's trust Him together. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the promises from Your Word. We know that uh, Mr. Pavitt often reminds us that there's over 22,000 promises in Your Word. But Father, we thank You for this one. What a precious promise. Father, we pray that You'll help us to live lives that are, tr that are completely given over to You, trusting You. May we not worry about... Uh, about physical things because we know that, that you're our Father. Father, I pray that you'll help us to be thankful for all your provisions, your provisions of salvation, your provision, spiritual provisions for our church. We thank you for those. We also thank you for the physical provisions as well. And we help us to trust you as they continue. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a wonderful song in the book. <clears throat>